Um, before I introduce Fiona, I want to say one other thing. Amory got the biggest laugh of the day with uh, cold showers and warm beers. <laughs> Quite rightly, too. I have, I've heard that one before, and I've laughed uproariously at it. As, as I was listening to it this time, I was sitting there slightly miffed, because I actually had a cold shower this morning. Uh, and I hope I won't have a warm beer this evening. But after 20 years in England, the joke suddenly so, somehow seems to... It's, it's, it's hit me that it's a reality. Anyway. Um, so Fiona Harvey is here to chair the next one. She is uh, absolutely phenomenal, you will see. Uh, just prolific in her um, journalism on the environment. The most recent piece uh, appears to have been filed at 6 a.m. this morning on Big Food. I encourage you to read it. I'm sure you didn't file it at 6 a.m. It went, went live on 6 a.m. But she's award-winning. She's won the Foreign Press Association's Award for Environmental Story of the Year twice. Uh, and she's interviewed every big person you care to imagine, other than perhaps these four. So you'll add another four to your list uh, this evening and has been Women's Hour Power uh, Top 30, one of the top 30 women in the country uh, in the past as well. So thank you, Fiona. Look forward to this session. It's a little bit of a different structure. We're having some exciting pitches, but I will leave Fiona to introduce it. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. That was a very kind uh, introduction there. And uh, thank you all uh, for your attention. We are going to talk about the necessary art of the possible in this next session. We've already heard uh, some of the ideas on how we need to change the world and why we need to change the world. For this session, uh, I've got four brilliant panellists here who are going to present one idea each on what they think needs to be done uh, as a matter of urgency to get to net zero and how we can all benefit from that. Uh, I'm going to introduce them uh, briefly uh, and ask them to give us those ideas. Then we'll discuss it and invite you to ask questions. Um, I should mention that throughout this discussion, you are very welcome to use social media. I think you know the, uh, the hashtag WFEE uh, and the Smith School account, of course, is at the Smith School. So please feel free to tweet and uh, Instagram and whatever else you want to do while uh, we are on this session. That would be great. Um, OK, I'm going to start with you, um, Professor. I will, um, I'll introduce each of our panellists, get their ideas, and then we'll, we'll start the discussion. It's Professor Eric Bonhocker. Be Beinhocker. Bonhocker. Beinhocker, who I'm, sorry. Eric Beinhocker, who I'm going to introduce first, who's Executive Director for the Institute of New Economic Thinking um, at the Oxford Martin School, also Professor of Public Policy Practice practice at the Blavatnik School, and he comes from a background in consultancy, having spent 18 years at McKinsey, where he was indeed uh, a partner before, uh, before coming to Oxford. Um, so, Eric, um, give us a flavour of your uh, big idea. Excellent. Thank you, Fiona. And uh, I'll come up to the podium. Um, I have to say, I feel like I'm on an episode of, of Dragon's Den, uh, making my pitch. Uh, well, the, the idea that I'm going to pitch to all of you is that uh, the surest way to get to net zero is to uh, drive the costs of clean energy down below the costs of dirty energy as quickly as possible. And my message is that that is both possible and that we have the policy tools to do it if we make it a major objective of policy around the world. Um, this uh, graph on the left shows all of the major energy uh, technologies and their costs um, from their first invention to today. Uh, so it goes all the way back uh, to the late 1800s. And the first thing you'll notice is on the upper right, the huge cost decreases in renewables. Now that's something we've talked a lot about in this conference and most of you are familiar with. Uh, what you may not know is that solar, that yellow line, and this is, a, by the way, a, 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 a logarithmic scale, so this is going through orders of magnitude, has declined 5,000 times since its first invention in the 1950s. 90% cost declines in, in more recent decades. Uh, wind, uh, uh, which is a little bit harder to see, but just to the right of there, declined 70%. Uh, batteries coming down rapidly as well. So that's, that's something that we're all familiar with and excited about. But what you may not know is the history of fossil fuels, which is down on the bottom there. They haven't experienced this kind of uh, cost decline over time, these learning curve uh, effects. 
And in essence, fossil fuels cost about the same today with lots of volatility, lots of up and down as they did when they were first dug out of the ground uh, uh, in, in the late 1800s. So again, hugely volatile, you know, often for geopolitical reasons as we're seeing today, but no secular fundamental uh, uh, cost declines. And so what we can see is the collision of these two curves into a tipping point uh, where these renewable technologies, which are declining in cost for very fundamental reasons, these are technologies where the more we make of them, the more we use of them, the cheaper they get. They follow something called Wright's Law or a, a learning by doing curve uh, and have been experiencing these exponential declines through their full history. And so we're approaching this tipping point where these technologies will become cheaper. Um, but the problem is it's not happening fast enough. Um, you know, these lines will cross sometime in the 2030s, 2060s, different parts of the world, different applications. Um, but there's lots of other non-cost barriers in the way, too. Uh, uh, energy infra infrastructure, grid issues, non-cost barriers, regulation, uh, and, and so on. So this transition will happen to zero carbon, but it's not going to happen fast enough. And as Bill McKibben, the environmental activist, has said, winning slowly in climate is the same as losing. Now, so we need to drive these curves down faster. Now, the good news is this will save us huge amounts of money and be very good for the economy. So our team here at Oxford has just published a, a paper uh, which models three uh, transition scenarios, a very fast transition where we uh, drive uh, to totally clean energy by 2050, a slower transition, and then a no transition where we basically carry on with the same system, and looked at the cost implications of those three uh, paths. And because of this learning by doing effect, again, the more we make, the faster we go with clean technologies, the cheaper they get. By going fast, we save $12 trillion in, in global uh, energy costs. Going faster is cheaper. And we can actually make more energy from that, helping end uh, energy poverty in the world and create lots of jobs. So my message is, we can do this, it will happen, it has to happen faster. So how do, we have to, how do we make it happen faster? It has to be through policy. And we also know from experience looking at what's worked and what hasn't worked over the past decades um, that policies can accelerate these cost declines by driving up deployment. And we're seeing a great example for that now in the US with the Inflation Reduction Act, which has lots of tax incentives and other policies uh, to really uh, boost investment and boost deployment, which will uh, further bring down these costs. Also having um, uh, renewable portfolio standards for utilities. Also very importantly, having sunset clauses where we phase out fossil fuels, such as the UK's decision to phase out fossil fueled cars, capital incentives, and quite importantly, we should stop subsidizing uh, uh, fossil fuels. And then we need to remove the bottlenecks, uh, uh, grid and uh, infrastructure, uh, storage, EV charging, uh, and, and, uh, and so on. And then finally, uh, we also, uh, none of this includes some of the newer exciting things that Amory Lovins talked about, um, and in particularly in these hard to abate sectors like uh, uh, steel, cement, and so on. Uh, we need to get those learning curves, which are at a much earlier stage uh, than the energy technology is also taking over too. But we're actually optimistic that in a number of those hard to abate sectors, there is the potential for these same kind of uh, 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 rapid cost declines uh, that we've seen uh, in wind, solar, and, uh, and batteries. So let's do it. Thank you. Oh, and if you want to look at the papers, uh, you can get them on the web. Thank you very much indeed for that, Eric. That's brilliant. This idea of making the clean, st st making the clean stuff cheaper faster is, uh, is exactly what we need. Thank you for that. I'm going to introduce Professor Sir Christopher Llewellyn Smith now. Yes, if you'd like to, that would be great. Thank you. Um, who is, as I'm sure you know, um, a theoretical physicist who's a professor of physics at Oxford. Uh, he's been the director of energy research at Oxford as well, a former director general of CERN, uh, of course, um, a fellow of the Royal Society and uh, is now um, looking for the British government at the question of whether renewable energy and energy storage uh, can, can power the country. So um, if you'd like to brief us on that, that would be brilliant. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Fiona. Uh, so I am leading a Royal Society study of large-scale electricity storage. And we've looked at the possibility that in 2050, all of Great Britain's electricity could be provided by wind and solar supported by storage. 
So this is the opposite end of what Amory said. He was trying to minimize storage. I'm asking what happens if you maximize it, if you like. This is not a new or very radical idea, so I don't know why I'm in this session. But I think the detail in which we've studied this question is new. Is there enough wind and solar? Yes. Actually, we have enough to provide all Great Britain's energy, not just electricity, as you'll see in a forthcoming Smith School pa uh, paper. Um, but that's on average, and of course, the wind does not always blow and the sun does not always shine. To find out how much storage is needed to fix this problem, you need to compare an hour-by-hour -hour model of demand and an hour-by-hour -hour model of wind and solar generation. There are no good models of 2050 hour-by-hour -hour demand in the GUP, as far as I know, publicly available, but AFRI Consulting kindly let us use a model of theirs. Our model of wind and solar is based on 37 years of real weather data from 1980 to 2016. But we found that if the need for storage, if we'd looked at 23 years, 1986 to 2008, it's less than half the need we'd have found if we looked at 37 years. So this led us to suspect that 37 years is not enough to provide a representative sample of rare weather events, which was confirmed by a study that the Met Office carried out for us. We're dealing with this by adding contingency, whether it's enough, not totally obvious. There's a very important lesson here. Don't believe any estimates of the need for storage that don't look at many decades of data. Just don't believe them. 23 against 37, factor of two wrong. And then you should add contingency. It turns out that it's necessary to store a lot of energy for very long periods because there's very long-term variability. And the only way to do this without going bankrupt is to store hydrogen in salt caverns. Not a big surprise. Hydrogen alone is not enough. You need some fast response storage to regulate the voltage and frequency, but that takes very little energy and to first approximation, you can ignore it. So to start with, we studied hydrogen alone in great detail, very carefully. It turns out that hydrogen alone can do the job at a reasonable cost. We looked at the cost of putting power into the grid because that's what the AFRI model did. I'm not supposed to give a number until our report is released, but I can tell you the cost of power into the grid according to our estimates with wind, solar and storage, just hydrogen storage, is between 40% and a factor of two more than what it was in the last decade, that 2010 to 2020. So that's a lot less than the CFDs for power, nuclear power at Hinkley or for bio at Drax, and it's a hell of a lot less than we've been paying last year. We looked at adding nuclear, but so then after looking at hydrogen, we added things. If you add nuclear, unless it's a lot cheaper than people think it's going to be, or hydrogen storage costs are at the upper end of our, our estimates, adding nuclear will put the cost up. So it, Probably not the best thing to do. We looked at adding other types of storage, compressed air, for example, talking about large-scale storage. This may put the cost down. I'll tell you why may in a second. So you should see the hydrogen-only, storage-only case as an upper bound. We're not necessarily saying you should do that. It could be that adding other things bring it down. If it puts it up, you wouldn't do it. So hydrogen alone is an upper bound. Now I say may because modeling with multiple stores has huge uncertainties. Hydrogen's cost is uncertain enough, but the other big scale technology has never been deployed at all. You really don't know that cost. And there's also a problem of scheduling with multiple stores, which has never been properly addressed. We have some ideas on it but it's not clear they would work in the present market. So there are big questions there. We also asked, would it be cheaper to provide the flexibility needed to complement high levels of wind and solar with natural gas with CCS rather than storage? It's not carbon neutral because there's CO2, carbon capture is not perfect and there's methane leakage, but it's low carbon. 
And the answer is probably no. Storage is cheaper as a complement than unless something amazing happens to the gas price and it goes down a lot. So the conclusion is that wind and solar could provide all Great Britain's electricity in 2050 at a reasonable cost with definitely with storage, including definitely a lot of hydrogen storage. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, thank you for giving us a sneak preview of uh, what you're going to find. That's very helpful. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to move on now to Musadora Jorgensen, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Microsoft UK. Um, she's got a, a career in various branches of technology um, and was named uh, one of the most influential women in technology in, uh, in 2021. So we're going to find out why. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Imagine a world where everybody is operating at their full potential. Uh, I head up sustainability for Microsoft in the UK and Microsoft's mission is to empower every person and every organisation across the planet to achieve more. And we know that we all desperately so need to all be achieving more, especially when it comes to living within the 1.5 degree climate rise that we know about. And that science tells us if we don't, uh, that we will have uh, devastating consequences. Now, Microsoft believe that uh, we can not only survive uh, in, in a world where we are operating, we get to the, the 1.5, but we can also thrive as well. But that comes with, together between the cornerstone of science and technology, meeting so that we can have the data that we need to mitigate risk, to use our environmental resources in a better way, and to ensure that our businesses, our organisations are transforming. And if there's one thing that business is going to, that we're going to transform around over the next 10 years, that's environmental sustainability. Now, Microsoft uh, have set our, oh, there we go. Sorry, ruin that. So Microsoft set our commitments in 2020 uh, to look at being carbon negative by 2030 and to remove all of the emissions that we've ever um, taken, put into the environment since we were founded in 1975. We've also said that we will be carbon, uh, so that we will be waste, zero waste, water positive, and that we will build the planetary computer, which is the world's biggest supercomputer focused on how we can report and record and have an open sourced um, uh, way that we can track what's happening with our nature and our biodiversity. And we are doing this internally. Uh, by helping to drive innovation and efficiencies where we can. And we fund that innovation by something called an internal carbon fee. Now, that carbon fee is $15 per metric tonne, which we use across all of our functions across the business to ensure that decisions are being made in the right way to drive for the sustainable outcomes that we need. So we've got that money that we can then use to drive for uh, innovation both within the business but also out into the market as well to invest in technology that others are coming up with that helps not only for the Microsoft things that we need but also for the rest of the world as well. And not only are we doing that ourselves, we're also helping our customers to do that too. And I, I get to spend um, lots of my time being out with our customers and seeing amazing innovations that are happening across the world and here in the UK using technology in the Microsoft platform. So that's things like artificial intelligence, AI and machine learning, helping to track and manage what's going on with biodiversity, particularly when with things uh, like uh, renewable uh, energy needs to come in and we need more um, renewable energy uh, and, and plants that help that uh, so that we can see the connection between the biodiversity and ensuring that that's safe uh, and protected how sustainable supply chains and using um, and driving down uh, energy and, and creating more efficiency means that we can create more sustainable products uh, and services out into the world. Things like the Internet of Things and what that does from a smart city's perspective is really ensuring that we're driving to collectively towards where we need to get to for 2050. 
So the opportunity that we can see is not only one that's going to drive for these sustainable outcomes when we're tapping into the innovation, but it's also good for business as well. And we know that by 2030, across the world, what that's going to do is drive 65 um, million new, new jobs across the world and $26 trillion worth of economic benefit. So we can see that um, it's good and it drives for the sustainable outcomes that we need to see, but innovation doesn't just happen. It needs to be fostered and thrived within a culture, it's something that Microsoft is really focused on in terms of how we can harness all of that uh, amazing energy and ideas and innovation that sits within our organization. So the things we need to be asking ourselves are, are we creating the environment as leaders within our organization to create the culture that unlocks this potential within people? Are we making people feel safe that they can make courageous decisions and push against the status quo? Are we allowing people to think about coming together in a better way? So are we inviting diversity of thought to share the experiences and the, and the skills that means that we can unlock new ways of doing things? And is our radius of, of intent focused just within what we can see or are we helping to collaborate into other areas as well across industry uh, and across uh, areas where we can see that we can drive efficiencies across the world? And the exciting thing I think is that we haven't found all the solutions yet as a world, that there are solutions waiting to be found, but if we can harness the power of people and of the human mind by bringing everybody together through that diversity of thought, I truly believe that we have the opportunity to live in a far more sustainable world and that, that we can unlock the power of collaboration, innovation and technology coming together to really accelerate it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very encouraging message there. And finally, I'm going to come to you, Tiffany. Uh, Tiffany Adams is Executive Vice President of the Climate Leadership Council. She's had a career spanning business, public policy, and the nonprofit sector, uh, and is advocating for net zero and uh, how we reach it now. So, Tiffany, if you could tell us your big idea, please. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to save all my panelists the time of turning around, there'll be no slides. It's not even really a new idea, but I do think it's big and I think we have the opportunity as a global presence to make a change. My big idea, and I, Eric, you asked me right before we started if I was familiar with Dragon's Den. I wasn't, but I think it might be the equivalent of Shark Tank in the States. So I'm gonna look at all of you as entrepreneurs and people who can help us make this big idea actually happen. My big idea is to usher in a new trade order, one that's going to reward those companies and those organizations that are carbon efficient in all productive, productive, produced goods. So this is no longer a time where we make trade agreements based on friendships. We make trade agreements based on carbon efficiency. We look at traded goods and we say across the globe, not just in the States, not just in the UK, not just in Australia, not just in Asia, across the globe, we are going to increase carbon efficiency and we're going to reduce our carbon footprint. We need folks to stop looking in just their backyards and we need to come together and decide, here is how we can make this work across the globe no more big domestic ideas that don't really translate across the globe. If it's a big domestic idea, we're gonna be working with the UK to make sure it's working domestically there and domestically within the United States and Asia, et cetera. So what's going to become obsolete with this big new idea? Well, again, those trade agreements that don't account for carbon efficiency. We're also probably not going to see those and this is not a dig, I'm very happy with the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act that just passed in the United States, but that's focused in the United States. We want to make sure that we have legislation that's coming out of our countries that are obviously going to benefit our own citizens, but benefit the globe. So it's not just going to work in the U.S., it's going to be able to translate globally. Um, 
that's a big deal and a big difference. We're sitting here, we're talking about the climate world, we're talking about things that we need to see changed, and we're too often talking amongst ourselves or with our own countrymen. We need to be sitting here across this stage saying, and what are you going to do, and how am I going to do it with you, and when do we start? So again, not a new idea, but I think a big idea if we're really going to face this challenge. 2030 is tomorrow. Is there anyone in the room who realistically, realistically thinks we're going to get to net zero by 2030? Realistically, I'd love to see a show of hands. Not by 2050, perhaps. Don't want to be the skunk of the garden party because I believe that we can as a world do this, but we are starting to use 2030 and 2050 as a catchphrase. So in 2027, we're going to step that back a little bit and say, well, 2030-ish. We don't want to say 2030-ish. We want to get to where we need to be. And I think the only way we can do that is with a big global idea like this and all of us working together. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I hope we can all uh, work together. And that's what I'd like to start with here is how we take the ideas that you've got uh, and universalize them. Uh, I'm going to come to you first, Mr. Dora, because you, you've told us uh, what Microsoft's doing as a company and so on. How can we make that universal across all companies in, uh, in the technology space and beyond? Yes. So I think the interesting thing here, when we look at the UK, Microsoft have done a study that shows that half, more than half of UK businesses aren't going to hit the 2050 goals that have been set. And a lot of the reason for that is um, that a lot of businesses, certainly the ones I've been talking to, haven't started or don't know where to start. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that there is a lack of skills in the market to be able to help set the overall strategy and then to execute against it. Um, interestingly, you may know LinkedIn is part of Microsoft. We know at the moment the top 10 roles in the, in the UK today, eight of those are technology roles which is great from a digital transformation perspective and technology being a big part of helping to accelerate where we need to be. But quickly, we're going to see all of those being replaced with sustainability roles, sustainability jobs. Uh, and we know that as soon as people come out of university, they're snapped up, put into to places that, you know, it's a, the market in terms of, of where these people are going is in high demand. So that's the first thing, that there aren't enough people to help um, accelerate this across business. And the second thing is, is a data challenge. So when uh, organisations are being asked to think about uh, or report and, and record and track where they are to ensure that they're reducing, uh, it's an absolute nightmare. I don't know how many of you um, will, will resonate with this, but trying to gather the data that might sit in silos that may not be dynamic, to look at how, how to bring it all together to then be able to make better decisions in terms of, of how, um, how businesses are operating, but then to be able to report on it is, is, is tricky. So having a, you know, a strategy around that to be able to then make the better decisions is critical. So I don't think there's one, there's one um, answer, but we can see that there's a number of, of areas that need to sort of get fleshed out before uh, we can see the acceleration, certainly in business, uh, across um, getting to net zero. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Chris, I'd like to return to you next, because again, you've looked at uh, the British uh, power sector and, and what can be done here. Uh, what do you see? How, how could these lessons be taken across the world? Well, first of all, I should say, we studied the UK, or Great Britain, our results do not translate to the rest of the world, but the methods do. And the reason the results don't is that it's very local. It depends on the weather, and it depends on the resources. We have very little hydro resource in this country, but if you're in Ontario, you've got lots of hydro and lots of pumped hydro. And if you want to use hydrogen, which we were advocating, you've got to have salt deposits to make the caverns, and not everywhere has salt caverns. So it's horses for courses. You can't say this is the solution. As far as the methods are concerned, um, I think we'd learned two things that do translate. The one is you've got to look at very long periods. I think that's just generally true. And the second is we've discovered that uh, something which is a lot of the academic studies do things like, for example, we want to find out the cost of underground storage. So they go to the literature and they say, 
to store hydrogen underground costs so much per ton, and they read all the papers, and they find the mean, and they put an error. But the fact is, the cost per ton of storing hydrogen underground decreases like one over the square root of the number of tons. And I'm sorry to say a lot of our academic colleagues haven't noticed that, so they quote numbers which are completely meaningless without giving the scale. So I think that's one of our messages for the people who study these things. I think, I hope we've given, shown people what methodology to use to do these things. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Um, Eric, what's the biggest obstacle, do you think, to uh, universalising this idea of making green stuff cheaper, faster? Well, um, I, think, I think part of the obstacle is we, we haven't been aware that this idea was out there. For, for a long time, the um, policy philosophy backed by economists like me and others was make the dirty stuff expensive. So we should have you know, carbon pricing, carbon markets, carbon taxes, and, and, and so on. And in theory, that's a very good idea, and markets are efficient and all that business that we teach our economic students. But the political reality is the dirty stuff fights back. And the politics of that have been very, very hard. So it's been almost impossible to get truly effective carbon prices covering a lot of emissions anywhere. And so the EU ETS, the biggest experiment in this, has actually reduced embarrassingly little carbon. Making the clean stuff cheap has great politics. And we've seen an example of that just almost by accident again in the US uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act. That was a messy compromise out of the unique politics there. But what they found they could get everyone on board on was um, uh, pushing deployment, tax subsidies, and, and other things that would um, expand the markets for clean energy, which in turn will, uh, will drive the, the costs down. And so I'm hopeful as more countries that have struggled with their own domestic politics on these issues realize that you can create political consensus around this strategy uh, more easily uh, than the old strategy that will see this spread. And then we know a lot of the policies actually really do work, again, almost by accident. So um, our, our, our group, uh, along with some others, uh, studied the German feed-in tariff program, um, which you know, was to subsidize uh, adoption of, of solar panels, but that had a global impact by expanding the demand for solar panels. Again, it drove down the cost, not just in Germany, but in Bangladesh. Um, and same with the Chinese 12 five-year plan, which expanded you know, their production quite a bit. That drove down prices uh, globally. So you can get these very positive spillover effects um, from national policies, particularly in the big you know, developed countries that can make and buy a lot of this stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Tiffany, finally, um, the biggest obstacle, I mean, it makes sense to, uh, to universalize, as you've said, for everyone to, to come together. What's the biggest obstacle to what you want to happen? I could be cheeky and say the egos of individual economies, but I won't. Um, I will say that if finding, well, identifying those like-minded climate ambitious countries who are willing to cooperate with one another um, is not hard to identify, but in theory, it is hard to execute. Um, each country is going to undoubtedly look at their individual economies and, and they're going to wait for the other one, quite frankly, to jump first. And I think that all of the waiting has us all in a holding pattern where we're not moving forward. We, we know what a good trade agreement looks like. We know that there are companies who very accurately um, measure their carbon output. We know that there are many that don't. If the countries come together and, and quite frankly stop thinking of the individual economy and think of the global economy, then we could get there. But right now everyone's waiting for the other to say boo and we're not getting anywhere nearer. Um, but that sounds a bit pessimistic because I think we're closer than we think. It may start off with a few bilateral agreements. It may start or trilateral agreements. But I think that we can spread this further, particularly as companies are working across lines. I think of a company like Microsoft that we work very closely with at the Climate Leadership Council and their reach uh, across the globe and how they're willing to work with their partners and those who aren't yet partners is what's going to get us there but I think it's gonna take more time than we'd like, but we've gotta keep fighting this fight every day. Thank you very much. Thanks for that wisdom there. 
Um, I'm going to invite our audience to uh, ask questions now for our panelists. Um, we've got some questions over here. If we could get, get microphones to... Yes, lovely. I, I, I'll ask... Uh, you've got two um, questions there, I think, so... There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, Simon Clark, I'm a partner at Kaya. We're a political uh, climate advisory firm. And Tiffany, I just wanted to pick up on your CBAM uh, point, on your carbon border adjustment uh, argument, which is compelling. Uh, and you understand Republicans probably better than many other people oh. in the room. Uh, so there's a lot of speculation that after the midterms, the Biden administration is going to start talking about trade deals uh, and start talking about a, a trade deal with the EU that would have a carbon border adjustment mechanism or a climate club or something along those lines. Do you see Republicans giving Biden the space to do the deal? I do. Yes. Um, and I think that that is maybe a surprise to many, but I spend an awful lot of time I'm talking to everybody, whether they be in the administration or in the House and Senate, but uh, particularly those who are in the conservative climate caucus, they are focused on not just the good policies, quite frankly, they're also trying to keep their seats. So they are seeing that their supporters, the voters in their districts and in their states, care about them talking about climate. They want them to push that envelope and they certainly want them to walk away from the climate denying that we've seen unfortunately over the last several years. So again, those baby steps, but I think that how we get there will be the debate. But will we get there? I think yes. I have already heard some folks talking about, well, we'd rather do TPA. That's okay, let's have that discussion. I think it can be happen, it can happen. How widespread? That one I'm not gonna put money on. I'm not even convinced that you know the the house flips after the midterms. I'm not yet convinced. I'm giving myself, I've given myself a few more weeks before going out on that limb, but I do think uh, that Republicans are paying attention, and I think they will give the president room to create these agreements. Great, thank you. We look forward to hearing more from the Conservative Climate Caucus. There, they seem to be quite quiet. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> thank you for that. We had a question here. Lawrence Wainwright from the uh, from the Smith School. So something we haven't really spoken about much today is uh, is human nature and um, why people do what they do, why people change, why they're resistant to change, um, how we can actually ensure that um, our policy changes and technological advancements are congruent with um, with human nature, um, and also getting beyond some of the uh, occasionally primitive understandings within behavioural economics that we have around assumptions around people. So my question really is, um, how can we best utilize our understanding of, of, of people and psychology to, uh, to best uh, get us to net zero and sustainable development. Thank you. Anyone like to respond to that? I think, um, yeah, Eric. Well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. Uh, take a crack. Um, no, it's, 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 it's a great question. You know, as, as economists, we tend to focus on, you know, is the price higher or lower? And my little talk was on making clean stuff cheaper. That would certainly help, but that's not the, the only thing. Um, you know, a lot of the research shows that actually social norms play a big role in our decisions. You know, we rarely make our choices on these things just as atomistic individuals. So the kind of cars your friends are driving affects the kind of car you drive, you know, how, what your house is like and, you know, versus your neighbors. There was a famous uh, German uh, study of recycling uh, behavior. Um, where they were trying to get people to re, you know, uh, recycle more, and they tried paying them, they tried fining them, they tried all kinds of things. What worked was they made the bins bright orange, and when you saw your neighbors put their bins out, you felt like you had to put your bins out too. So I would say that's, that this kind of uh, social norming and social expectations um, is an underappreciated uh, lever, and it also affects the politics as well. Thank you. And Chris, you'd like to come in? Uh, well, I think... Um, well, first of all, I agree with the people in the last session. Reducing demand is absolutely vital, and this is all about attitudes. How to do it's very difficult. There was a, a um, behavioral economist who was in Oxford, he's gone to Chicago, uh, who studied Camden, and they took people in social housing, and they took, these are poor people, they put half the bills they put on it. If you turn the thermostat down, you can spend, uh, you'll save so much a month. And the other half, they didn't. And the people who's given that message, their consumption went up. Because they said, damn it, I've been freezing, and it, but it's only this much a month, I can turn the thermostat up. So the way you put the message is very important. 
And actually, my hope is that what's happening in Ukraine is going to be very helpful. I mean, I have been turning my thermostat down in the last few weeks. And, uh, you know, this is really bringing home to people the importance of these things. But it's a really good question, and it's very, very difficult. How do we change attitudes? Thank you. Yes. What I'd like to know is how to get people out of these SUVs, actually. I mean, I've never seen so many tanks on the road as when I was growing up in Belfast. It's ridiculous <laughs> what people are driving now. And, um, yeah, my big idea, if I was uh, a panellist rather than moderating, would be to ban the things, actually. Um, but that's an aside. I'm going to ask for another question now from our, uh, from our audience to our panellists. Here we go. And we've got two in the front row. Thank you. Uh, I'm Cameron. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I've got a question for Chris. If, um, if you think, if we can do it in the UK, if we can get storage to cover a 40-year period, uh, so to cover the two or three weeks when we don't have renewals, is it harder or easier to do it elsewhere? Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't really answer that question because I haven't looked at other places enough. I suspect it's relatively difficult because I was looking at some work on Texas, for example, where they have a lot more sun, which is a bit more reliable. We're relying on very volatile wind in this country. By the way, we mix the solar wind mix so that it matches as well as you can demand. Whether you'll be able to build enough solar by 2050 for the case we take is not clear. If you can't, people think that storage is about taking energy from the summer to the winter when demand is high. But if here, if we get more wind than solar, it's going to be about taking it from the winter to the summer. So it's a very subtle question, in fact. But uh, so you want to be, I think there are areas that will be relatively easy, but I can't answer your question. I, I would just note that uh, there have been studies saying that the UK is actually one of the harder countries uh, to do renewables in, uh, both because of the weather and also limited interconnect op options. Um, so it, your study should make us optimistic about other places. I should say we didn't include interconnectors on two grounds. We realized that you can have wind droughts across Europe when it's very, very cold. So, you know, we can't rely, we feel we have to have a self-reliant system. And also I read in the FT that Penny Mordaunt, when she was a Minister of Energy, has said, we shouldn't be building more interconnectors. We should stop these interconnectors. It'll put us in the hands of the French. And then I thought, I thought, what a disgraceful sentiment. And then I thought, I better pay attention to that. I mean, look what happened with COVID vaccine and so on. I mean, I think in the first instance, we should build a system where we can be self-reliant. Having interconnectors will help manage the system, but I don't think we should be totally reliant on them. Great, thank you. Chris, on your behavioral remark, I envisage armies of grandmothers uh, supplemented by industry in volume, knitting cheery yellow and blue woolly caps. Uh, and if we wear them in the winter, we can be perfectly comfortable turning down the thermostat about three degrees. And uh, as I recall, it's about 6% of Russian gas export per European degree of winter thermostat setting. And one could also imagine uh, spreading habits like a little sign in the front window, this is a Putin-free household, <laughs> or in the, in the window of a shop. This sort of thing could spread rather nicely over the winter. I couldn't hear that properly, but I'm saying you know, uh, we should have Putin-free households with lower thermostats. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can't disagree with that. <laughs> no, I, I think few of us would want to disagree with that. Um, we are approaching the end of this uh, session. We, we started a little bit late, so I'll give you the chance to ask one more question if anyone would like to. We've got a oh, we've got a hand up over there. I didn't see you. We'll ask these two last questions and then we'll, we'll let our panelists finish. And here, yeah. You, um, Zoe Sprigging, C40. Um, it was a question about um, international trade, and I guess particularly thinking about increasing. Um, uh, sort of, the prospect of trade wars or increasing conflict between the US and China, also UK and Europe. But like how much do your big ideas rely on frictionless global trade for supplying the various technologies that you're relying on? Um, yeah. I don't know how deeply I can go into that thought. 
with the big idea. I mean, every time I hear the words trade and wars together, I, I cringe because I do know that as I look through this and, and as we think about the kinds of trade agreements that we think will come out of this great big idea, it really is about those like-minded, climate conscious economies. And I know that there are plenty of countries, um, we've talked about two of them today, that I'm not sure would be involved heavily in those, uh, those agreements. And that takes me back to two places ago where, and I haven't even talked about that today, and that is a price on carbon. So when you have these trade ag agreements that are based on carbon efficiencies with a carbon price, those countries that don't get involved with those trade agreements will pay the price ultimately. And those countries that are carbon efficient are going to increase their competitiveness. So it, it's, it's an odd little path, but I think it always comes back to that carbon efficiency. So I can't say what the, the Russias and the Chinas of the world will do. Um, I, my hope would always be that every country gets on board. But I do know that with these kinds of agreements and with the price on carbon, the competitive and the conscious will come out on top. Thank you. And Musidor, would you just like to give us a word from business on that, on that point, please? Well, look, I think that you know, the, the role of business is to help accelerate and, and particularly the technology to, to find solutions to a lot of these things. And so where, and certainly Microsoft, where we can put our weight behind policy and, and you know, use our voice for things that we need to uh, ensure that that is accelerating forward, we do. Um, so I think you know, it, it, there's no one silver bullet to, to all of this, unfortunately, but I think you're right, the, working in like-minded um, organizations and, and um, you know, people all driving towards the same thing, I think is part of the answer. Thank you. Thank you. And our final question over here, please. So question for Eric, but other people might want to answer as well. Um, I really loved your point about learning by doing. Um, and we often have a debate in um, the UK and probably other places as well about whether companies should be a leader or a fast follower. What's the smarter strategy? Um, but how would you convince companies that actually that, you know, they need to learn by doing, on the sidelines and waiting for somebody else to bring the cost down and then enter the, enter the market later? Yeah. Um, the, the, you know, uh, uh, it's a key question, particularly for uh, companies that are in the kind of you know, old energy uh, economy is you know, can they extend and, and bring their skills into this new, uh, new energy economy? So you know, you've got leaders, new startups, innovative companies that are built from scratch like Tesla you know, for, for EVs. But uh, for the companies that are trying to bridge from the old to the new economy, they have no choice but to do the learning, uh, learning by doing. Um, and you know, we've seen transitions like this before. So the Wright's law, which is driving this huge cost decline in energy, is a relative of Moore's law, which we're all familiar with from the tech space. Um, and Moore's law uh, put a huge number of companies out of business. So how many of you use a Smith Corona typewriter? Not many. Um, you know, they didn't bridge the Moore's law gap. They're gone. Uh, Kodak disappeared, you know, didn't make it into digital photography. But then you have companies like IBM that used to make typewriters that now are you know, still in, in, in business making computers because they weren't sitting on the sidelines. They were trying to you know, get in front of and ride that Moore's Law wave over, over, over decades. And so you know, for the um, energy companies and fossil fuel companies, mining companies and others, uh, they really have, have no choice uh, but to uh, learn by doing. And, and that also is an answer to the greenwashing question, because if you're greenwashing, you're going to go out of business. Well, we can but hope, because a lot of greenwashers seem to stay in business, I'm afraid, frustratingly. Um, OK, thank you very much to um, all of our panellists. We had a selection of ideas there that are not only possible, which we need to keep remembering, but also absolutely necessary if we're going to reach net zero. So um, thank you very much to uh, all of them. Thank you to all of you. And I'd invite you to join me in thanking them. <laughs>